And if you don't mind, I, I'd like to just go ahead and talk with you a little bit before we shut it down. Is that okay with you? Oh, that's fine. Okay. Um, so we, I'm Marlo Blue. This is Execution Watch. Uh, this is part of the KPFT 90.1 FM program. It's a radio program that comes out of Houston, Texas. We are broadcasting live from Houston Media Source. Thank you for those of you who are joining us. Joining me right now in the studio uh, is Larry Douglas. Hello, Hello, Larry. Hello, Marlo. Hello, Pam. And, and we are here with Pam Perillo. Hi. Hi, Pam. Thank you for joining Hi. us today. Uh, so uh, you, you have an interesting life, uh, definitely. You were yes, on Larry. Texas's death mm -hmm. row for almost 40 years. What, what yeah, goes on in your mind on an execution day like today? I'm just so grateful. I came two days away from my execution, so I know what he's going through right now. It's just amazing to me that he did get a stay. I'm very, very happy for him. Um, but I was on death row for 20 years. I had two different execution dates. I heard the man earlier talking about Jim Skelton. He was actually my attorney. Right. And he did me a lot of wrong. And uh, I'm grateful that I took him to court on that and showed people what he was about. Uh, I actually went to the state bar afterwards and got him disbarred. So, uh, as you know, he was having sex with the star state witness against me, Linda Fletcher, and she was my co-defendant, and he was my lead attorney. And so the court of the Fifth Circuit overturned my case on conflict of interest and ineffective counsel. <laughs> Because of Skelton, and so my case was overturned. Thank God. I guess I should thank Linda in a way, but uh, so I did 20 years on death row, two execution dates. I uh, spent another 20 years in population before I made parole. I was on death row with Carla Faye Tucker, who was my best friend for 14 and a half years, and the state of Texas executed her in 98. But uh, I saw three of my friends get executed that I was there with for many years. It's a hard thing uh, to go through. I uh, went a long time in the criminal system. So did you have a question? Tell us about Carla Faye Tucker. Carla Faye was my best friend. I actually met Carla in 84 when she first came in. I was back in the county jail on a bench warrant and fixing to face my second trial. And uh, an officer came to my cell and asked me if I would go talk to a young lady on the fourth floor who they were seeking the death penalty on. And when I got up there, it was Carla. And so I got to meet Carla in the county. She got the death sentence, and I got the death sentence for a second time and went back to death row and spent 14 and a half years there with her. When I first met Carla, she uh, was a very hard, cold person. Um, she actually went to a teen challenge uh, yeah. Bible study that came into the county jail. She walked out of there and took a Bible off the table, and she thought she was stealing it, but she was act they were actually free Bibles. She went back to her <laughs> cell. Yeah, she went back to her cell and started reading it, <laughs> and the next thing she knew, she woke up in a pile of tears. It was the first time Carla had ever read the Bible, so um, she gave her life to Jesus then and went back to death row with me. And I just saw an amazing transformation in that young girl. And a lot of people say that you get jailhouse religion, and a lot of people do. I've seen it. But I've never seen a person so real about her walk and her life. And it was sad to me. 
that when Carla had her date, the media turned it into a gender issue where if they execute the men, they should execute the females for the same crimes. And so it was very publicized. She was the first female to be executed in over a hundred years. The last one was a lady named Shapita Rodriguez, who was executed in about a hundred years ago. So um, it was a very big deal for the state of Texas to execute a female, and it was very publicized, and it turned into a big circus. And I don't know, Clinton, if you were on death row at the time when Carla was executed. No, but ma'am. it was a very big deal. No, I was in TYC. Um, TYC. Yeah. Yeah, I grew up actually in foster homes and juvenile hall my whole life. So I would I would call myself system raised because I've been in the system my whole life. It's been a hard transformation for me out there. And if it wasn't for the people in my life and the support system I have, I probably wouldn't have made it after 40 years. No doubt. It's been no doubt at amazing. All. Hey, Pam. I actually... Hi. It's Meryl from uh, Miguel's case. Hi, Meryl. Hi. How are you? Nice to see did you. Did you get my nice letter? I did. Yes, it was great. Thank you. Good. Good. I'm glad. Uh, so let's... I, I really am curious. And the same thing with you, Clinton. What happens on execution days? Do you get a special knot in your stomach? What what well, kind I mean, of process do you go through? I was only eight days out on my first one, right? And okay. um, I don't think I ever truly accepted that they was going to. I mean, um, and plus, when you spend so many years down there, yeah, it's like people, I don't know, I don't know if it's the same for the women that were on death row because they don't have their revolving door of executions like it was when I first came to, to death row. You know, my first came to death row, they were knocking out 20, 30 a year. Right, right. And um, uh, some two in a week. And so there's a numbing effect to it because it just happens so much and you spend so much time and you're there for so many years and you're fighting and dealing with it that like you put... Me and Robert Pruitt had this conversation about this, actually. You spend so much energy trying not to get that execution date. Right. That when you finally end up getting it, it's you're like, well, all right. And it just, I mean, there's certainly not an acceptance that comes with it. Some people, they do, right? But it's certainly not an acceptance. It's just, it your mind switches gears. It's it's really hard to explain, right? It's just a, um, yeah, it's just, it's something I hope nobody has to experience, right? It's just the way the mind, like I said, the only thing, best way I put it is kind of shift gears on it, right? Right. Um, there is certainly an anxiety there. Um, but then you're also so focused again, on trying to get everything situated with your family and friends, um, last minute efforts on your case, etc. That while you're focused on that final day, mm -hmm. you're distracted about everything you have to do up to that final day, right? Right. But then little frustrations, though, like if something would happen or if an officer would do something or certain things would happen, it becomes that much more of a bigger deal because um you know you really are on limited time yeah like the plan don't work out you ain't got too many opportunities left to make this plan like you got plan a maybe plan b but you ain't got c d e and f right like you gotta make it happen you know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> i think it's a hard thing when you know the time the place and how you're going to be executed I just wanted to be able to walk into that room with my head held high, get up on that jersey and go. And the hardest thing for me during that was 
my family having to see it, I didn't put them on the witness list. Um, I actually just had a friend that was going to go in there with me. But it would have been so much easier had you just been taken in there and get it over with and not have to go through uh, the process of the victim's families being there, your family being there. And it's just really having to say goodbye to my son was the hardest thing that I ever had to experience. And he said he was just going to grab a hold of my neck and not let me go. And so that was the hardest thing for me was knowing that I would have to say goodbye to my family and put them through that as well as my victims, families, I mean, what do you say? You can't give back what you took. You can't make up for what you did. And I'm sorry just seems like words to them. Hmm. And I had the opportunity to actually write one of my victim's families a letter because she wrote me and told me just go on and die and give us some closure. And I wrote her back. And I told her, you know, I know I'm sorry just sounds like words, but I am so deeply sorry. And if taking my life would bring back what I took, I'd take it myself. But I can't. And that's a hard process for all of us to go through, is any of that. I can't imagine what Reuben is feeling right now. You know, I'm so grateful that he got a stay. And um, I just really thank God for that right now. Yeah. You know, for me, I didn't have no children. So, I mean, I, can, I can't imagine what it's like for parents to go through in that situation. Um, and for me, when it came out to the execution date, exactly my last day, I had my mind made up. Yeah, maybe there's another reason why it kind of like had a numb effect. I was going to fight. I fought him while I was there. So many people walked to that gurney and lay down. All right. And some have this idea, this concept of a noble death. You know, you go over there, lay your head down on a ch uh, chopping block, and the king cuts your head off, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, this noble death of antiquity. I didn't do it. I wasn't supposed to be there. They weren't supposed to be killing me. And so I wasn't going to accept that. Uh, I had it all planned out my last day and uh, all I was going to do and I was going to lock the door up. And they were going to beat my, they have to beat me up from that cell all the way to that gurney. And so in my mind, I knew my last day on this earth was going to be pretty painful, right? But I fought to live my whole time there. You know, when I first got there, I was always on this very level protesting because I didn't like the way they treated us. Um, and so it was just unfathomable for me to, personally, for me, I'm not saying this against anybody else, but for me to sit there and tell the world, hey, I'm innocent, but yet I'm just going to go over and lay down. And I already knew, like, I didn't want nobody to witness my execution because I didn't want them to see that to be the last thing they seen. My mother wanted to and another friend wanted to because they didn't want me to be alone. But I didn't want them to remember me. That'd be the last. I'd rather them see me smiling at visitation versus being covered in pepper spray and beat up laying on a gurney. Yeah, and uh, and I knew the prosecutor would attend. And uh, we had we had a real animosity <laughs> towards each other. It was well known. Like we had a bunch of back and forth during my trial, right? <laughs> and so. <clears throat> um, you know, and so my situation was like, I wasn't going to be laying on a gurney saying I'm sorry because I don't have, I didn't kill nobody. You know what I'm saying? And so um, I was going to be out laying on that gurney talking about I'm coming back to haunt the DA and et cetera. Et cetera. <laughs> so I mean, I'm going to be talking cash. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry for I can't say that. My bad. I, I've been talking cash smack, right? Like, it was. <laughs> I don't blame you. I mean, you. <laughs> I mean, it's just, and like Ruben, 
I, I can kind of get an idea of what he's feeling because I was there with Lester Bauer. Lester Bauer had like what? 12 execution dates or something at, crazy like that. Something crazy. Robert Pruitt had yeah. like five or six. At least. I mean, and um, when you get over to that wall, it's just like what they all said was they didn't want to, but when they got to that point, mentally, they was at peace, for example, right? Like, you know, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. If you will. And when you go through it so many times, it's like if a person takes you on the street, and puts a gun to your head and sit there playing with you, pulling the trigger, pulling the trigger, pointing upon the trigger. Eventually, you're going to say, hey, look, man, Pull. whatever. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just whatever, man. Like, you know, and that's a cold way to look at it. It's just, like I said, it, it happens so much. And I mean, really, it's, it should be unconstitutional like to a person have to go through all these execution dates. I mean, um, if people say the system works, well, if the system works, then Lester Barrow, for example, wouldn't have had 10, 11, 12 execution dates. Right. It clearly yeah. shows there's problems in the law, there's problems in the system, and et cetera, right? Yeah. And so, um, uh, my dog started to bark. But, um, yeah, I mean. Let me ask you both the question. Um, you know, one of the things they say when they do, uh, one of the things that all of our institutions say is that they will specifically prepare you with the tools needed to turn your lives around successfully if and you ever get out. Do you believe that that is something that happened? Did you get the tools no. that you needed? No. No. I didn't even have release papers. I couldn't even prove I was a citizen of the state of Texas. Hmm. because I hadn't had any documented history of me in the free world since I was 18 years old. Right. So for 21 years, and when they let me go because I left death row instead of population, right. they didn't give me release papers. And so I called Huntsville, and they was like, we, uh, uh, we talked about your situation, but we just didn't know what to do because we never dealt with this before. And so, uh, Daisy! But, um, so anyways, but, um, that's my dog, but, um, I didn't have release papers. So when I wanted to go get identification and et cetera, I couldn't, I couldn't prove I was a citizen. You know, I mean, I spent 20 years in solitary confinement. They didn't make me go to therapy or nothing. That is open the door. I went from being so dangerous. I had to die to open door and hey, good luck. You know. What about you, Pam? You. What about you? What was the question? Do you feel like when you left what is now, uh, well, the Mountain View unit or the Patrick L. O'Daniel unit, which is, I guess, what they call it now, do you feel like y you had? the tools that you needed to uh, live in society again? I wouldn't say I had the tools to live in society because I didn't even know what society was anymore. I right. went in when I was 24 years old. Right. I came out when I was 64. For me, while I was in there, I tried to do whatever I could do to learn something. I went into the dog program and I worked for Patriot Paws and I trained service dogs for seven and a half years for disabled veterans, which gave me a feeling of giving back. I was actually um, doing something that meant something to somebody else. And I also learned the training. I learned to train dogs. And so, uh, that helped me when I when I did get out. I was able to uh, work with dogs and not uh, service dogs anymore, but I did work with dogs on basic behavior. And if somebody wanted their dogs taught something, I could do that. So I got married. TDC is not going to give you anything. 
if you don't do something for yourself, it's not going to get done. So I uh, get the things that I needed to do that was going to give me something out here. I applied for Social Security Disability while I was still in prison and got it when I got out, which helped a lot because I've never worked a day in my life. And uh, like I said earlier, I had my son in a very good support system that helped me get going again. But it, TDC will not give a person anything. So uh, we got to do everything for ourselves. Well, I want to thank you all for, for hanging in there with us. This is a, a moment of joy because we're not having an execution. We are very happy about that. I want to thank you again, Pam, Pam Perillo, for joining us, and Clinton Young. Um, Meryl was with us earlier, Meryl Pontier, and, of course, Larry Douglas. We're going to wrap this up here on Facebook Live for Execution Watch for KPFT 90.1 FM in Houston and for Houston Media Source. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Good night. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Larry.